And now uh, uh, let's welcome Elisa Felsche, who will give the first talk of this session. Thank you. Um, so I would like to talk about how we investigated how members of different species incorporate causal as well as social evidence in their decision to copy others. And with we, I mean um, mainly Emma, Daphna and Amanda who have started this project when they all worked in St. Andrews. And if I would invite you to St. Andrews, you would probably see a lot of these people around. And if you're brave enough to also try out to golf one day, and if you have no idea about golf, just like me, then you might start by just watching what people around you do. And when you do that, you will maybe copy their stance and their grip on the club, but you will not copy how they scratch their knee or clear their throat. So how do you actually make that decision, what to copy and what not to copy? And that this question is interesting, was surely evident when the phenomenon of over-mutation um, came up, and here in a first study by Horner and Whiten, um, they presented chimpanzees and children with a puzzle box um, on which they demonstrated a few actions. And then when the box was opaque, members of both species copied faithfully all of the actions until they got the reward. However, when the box was made transparent and it was evident that the first actions were actually unnecessary to get the reward out of the box, most of the chimpanzees, or the chimps in general, went straight to doing only the necessary part, whereas the children copied all of the um, unnecessary steps before they got at the reward. And so the question was here, why do humans, and so far only humans, copy visibly, causally unnecessary actions? Especially because in other situations, infants and children do show that they can copy selectively. And many theories have been proposed for why this phenomenon of overimitation emerges. And even though there is more or less evidence for all of these theories, what is clear that none of them can explain all the findings, and it's probably all of them together um, that children consider. So they may want to affiliate with the model or follow the rules of the game, but also find out how to get the stick out of the box. So they have to integrate these goals when they copy. But even in an instrumental context, when they maybe really are interested um, which actions are to find out which actions are necessary to get a sticker out of the box, they already have to integrate a lot of information. So on the one hand, there's causal evidence. For example, their prior knowledge about objects' work in general, how the physical work is, world is structured. For example, there's gravity. They know about the contact principle, as well as the they see the statistical evidence um, in the demonstrated action sequence. But on the other hand, there's of course also the social evidence. So you may rather copy from the professional golf teacher than from your fellow learners. And also you consider um, the intentionality of the demonstrators. So do they actively want to teach you these actions or do they just accidentally do something and then you will not copy that most probably. So we wanted to see how these two um, factors are integrated by different species when they copy, and if differences in this integration process may lead to differences in the behavioral, the copying outcome in the end. So in the first uh, study, uh, we included preschoolers as, of course, that species that shows over-mutation that has relatively good causal understanding, understands the intentions of others as well as is receptive to pedagogy and to ostensive cues. And on the other hand, capuchin monkeys who have not yet been tested in an over-mutation paradigm and who, despite having quite good causal understanding and maybe even understand intentions of others, have not yet been shown to understand any kind of pedagogy. And then in a second study, um, toddlers and dogs were added to the sample because these are species that have been shown to react to communicative cues by humans and ostensive cues, but that may not have a fully developed theory of mind as we learned in the um, last few days and thus um, might not um, have the understanding to perform over mutation. And as a third species, we added chimpanzees. Um, who again have a good cause understanding, understand the intentions of others, but um, 
it is debated whether they're receptive to ostentation or not, but we also hear another talk about that um, just after this one. So we know definitely an interesting species to study in this context. Um, so how did we manipulate the causal and the social evidence? Um, the causal evidence was manipulated by giving each participant two boxes and two consecutive sessions. Um, on the connected box, um, the action sequence that we always presented, A, B, followed by the reward, was on the same box. So here, um, the action A is quite likely to have something to do with the reward production. However, when action A was presented on a different box, it was less plausible to be um, to have anything to do with the production of the reward. And on the other hand, the social evidence was manipulated here by the demonstrator intentionality. So some children saw a pedagogical demonstrator who made eye contact, um, who called the participant's name and sent other ostensive cues, whereas an intentional demonstrator went into the room, looked at the box, did all the actions intentionally, and also took part of the reward, but never looked at the child. And in the unknowing condition, um, the demonstrator kind of was flipping through a folder um, while picking up stuff from the table and then kind of unknowingly pressing the buttons, never looking at the box and never looking at the child. And first, before uh, every participant saw these experimental conditions, they had a baseline uh, session in which they saw an intentional demonstration only of one action, action B, followed by the reward. And this was done to see if they attend to the social demonstration and if they can follow this social cue. And members of all species did uh, more than chance start with action B that was also demonstrated and not with action A. So that was good. And then um, we presented them with the first experimental session. This was either the connected or the disconnected condition in which we demonstrated the A, B reward sequence. And then the third session um, again, A, B, reward. And in each session, we showed two demonstrations followed by five attempts of the learner. And importantly, for the participant, only ever action B was really necessary to produce the effect. So A was the unnecessary action, even though that was probably more evident in the disconnected than the connected condition, at least for someone who understands the causal principles. Um, and in order to analyze how and these different species integrate this information, and we developed a Bayesian computational model in which we wanted to find out what the learner thinks are the actually necessary action, depending on the actions they've seen and the outcome. And for that, in the bias formula, we have the term um, on the left of the right side, which basically is a really simple one. It just says that when the demonstrator does the necessary actions, the robot will come out and if they do not do what's necessary, they will not get a reward. But then the more interesting ones are the one on the far right, which is the prior, and, and it um, shows the prior knowledge about uh, causation in our case. So we had a prior if the participants think that one action sequences or two action sequences are more likely, but also, and the one we want to focus on today is the one for connectedness. So do did the participants, or does the learner here actually think that actions on a connected box are more likely than on a disconnected box. And then um, the sensitivity to the demonstrator intentionality was modeled by this term, which um, shows how the demonstrator chose the actions given the true cause of the machine, or like how the machine works. And um, if we assume that someone demonstrated that unknowingly, we said that they sample randomly from all the actions because they don't know how the box works, so they just do whatever. Um, and it, an intentional uh, demonstrator knows how the machine works and wants to get the reward, so they sample one of all the actions that work. So when the true cause is B, they might do AB, only B, or BB, but they will never do A only. And then a pedagogical um, demonstrator is assumed to have this recursive element in here. So the learner thinks that the teacher will be helpful and show them the best way how to get the reward. And so the learner thinks about the teacher so that the teacher, yeah, gives the learner the best outcome. Um, here are the results from the model. So these are no data. This is just what the model now puts out. And you see on the y-axis the proportion of trials in which the learner starts with pressing A instead of pressing B. 
And we can see on the very left, we have a learner that uh, is not sensitive to causation, so doesn't care whether it's connected or disconnected, and also does not know anything about intentionality, so they act, in, uh, act randomly in each condition. Then the second one uh, shows a learner that is sensitive to causation but blind to intentionality. So they always press A more when it's on the connected box than when it's on the disconnected box. Then an intentionality sensitive learner that does not understand pedagogy, only intention, and they show more copying in the intentional and pedagogical condition compared to the unknowing one. And finally, a pedagogically sensitive learner um, that now shows an interesting effect because in the pedagogical condition, um, the pedagogy kind of trumps their own causal understanding, at least that's what the model shows, and we get almost 100% copying of action A in both conditions. So now we get to the actual data. Um, so the preschoolers, they actually look a lot, like the model I just explained. So in the unknowing condition, we see that they can differentiate between the connected and the disconnected box. However, when they see a pedagogical demonstration, they almost always copy the first action. And the capuchin monkeys, they don't. They um, are also sensitive to the cause of manipulation. However, they show no difference depending um, on the intentionality condition. So when we fit the model predictions to the um, data, we see that the children are best explained by the pedagogically sensitive learner and the capuchin monkeys by the intentionally blind learner. Um, now on to the toddlers. They have overall very low copying rates of action A, so they usually go for B reward. Um, but here we can see that in the intentional and pedagogical condition, they show more copying than in the unknowing condition. And the dogs, they look very much like the capuchin monkey, so no sensitivity to the intentionality, but um, yeah, differentiating causation. So when we compare that to the model, the infants or toddlers are best explained by the intentionally sensitive model and the dogs also by the intentionally blind model. And last but not least, the chimpanzees, they also look very much like the monkeys and the dogs, so they do not differentiate between the intentionalities in this study, um, but um, have considered that causal factor, and so they were also best explained by the intentionality blind model. So in conclusion, we can say that all species learn from a social demonstration, as we saw in the baseline, um, and that all of them also imitate selectively. So they consider some evidence that is given, um, but they treat the evidence differently. So the humans, they also take into account social information, whereas in our study, the other species did not. And so we can say that overmutation does not need some specific recently um, evolved adaptation, but is explainable by more broadly, more general um, differences in social understanding. And also, interestingly, the sensitivity to a, a, um, a to ostension in the toddlers and the dogs is not sufficient to trigger overimitation. So apparently it needs a more developed mind reading ability um, to be able to do that recursion to actually see this pedagogically demonstrated, demonstrated action is so important to almost always copy it. And that's it. Thank you. We have five minutes for questions, so try to ask short, short questions. There is uh, Hannes here. Otavio? And if you're on the back, please just, okay, I see. Uh, and then David, so whoever, uh, whoever is there. Good. Uh, thanks very much. That was a wonderful talk. Um, I've just got one question regarding um, especially the toddlers uh, and especially the pedagogical demonstrations. So what do you think they think about the A action? Mm -hmm. uh, and the background of this question is the dispute between causal confusion accounts and more conventionalist mm -hmm. normative accounts. So we, my intuition is they know perfectly well that it's causally relevant and the reason they're doing it is because they think it's conventionally uh, mm -hmm. or normatively relevant. Mm -hmm. um, so do you test whether they think it's causally, or do you have any data or any intuition on whether they think it's causally relevant? 
Um, I, we don't have no more data than this, so we cannot differentiate these two interpretations in this study. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Next question. Hi, thank you very much. So I was wondering whether you did not talk about the baseline uh, results. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, since especially the non-humans did something different than the, the humans in the baseline condition, whether that might explain your results in any way. So yeah, I left it up because I didn't have time, but um, especially the dogs and the chimpanzees, um, it's true there's something interesting in the baseline because they copy a less than chance when they are only demonstrated with B, but they copy it as the same rate as in the connected condition where they're presented with A, B reward. They copy B also about like, what's that, 25, 30% rate. Um, so yeah, we thought about this. That is definitely interesting and different to what um, the toddlers do um, and the capuchin monkeys and children do. And so that's a bit confusing because why do the chimpanzees not do that, and the capuchin monkeys do show that difference there. Um, maybe it's the chimpanzees were more exploratory just in the baseline, so um, that could be a factor that the capuchins maybe were really motivated to get the reward as quick as possible, and the chimps knew from, experiment, from their experience that, okay, I can try this, and then try that. Um, but yeah, that would be one idea that I had for that. Maybe one more question when our last speaker is setting up. Oh, I see over there, yes. Yeah, thank you. I have a question about the causal plausibility, and forgive me, I'm not super familiar with this literature. So um, it seems like the causal plausibility in your study is confounded with the distance from mm -hmm. the agent to the action. Can you speak about why you think it's they're encoding the plausibility as opposed to just like a simple action cost? Um, like well, the distance confound is in there, and we have a follow-up on that where we have both um, calls the conditions on the same box to um, yeah show it's not that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Elisa. Yeah. And our next speaker is Hannah Marno from CEU. I just need one second to switch between setups. Sorry, yeah, Can you, could you please switch to VGA? <coughs> okay, perfect. Let's get started. So, uh, good morning. It's still sort of the morning. Um, so this work that I'm going to present is uh, going to show a bit the opposite of what uh, we just saw in the previous talk, uh, namely that apes, they do care about uh, pedagogical cues, at least under certain circumstances, and that this can even uh, have an effect on uh, what they would uh, copy. Um, and uh, so this work we did in a nice team in collaboration with uh, Christoph Wörter, Brandon Tinklenberg, Dan Sperber, and Joseph Kohl. Um, so um, there is some evidence uh, about infants that uh, when they receive information in the context of uh, these uh, ostensive cues, uh, then they tend to attribute uh, relevance to this information. And the studies that show this, they typically use uh, imitation as a measure to indicate what they consider as being more relevant, and as a result, they would um, selectively imitate, as opposed to what they consider less relevant. So, for example, in this uh, famous Hattar study, um, we know that infants, they only copied the unusual action of the model, if uh, they didn't have any rational reasons why the model didn't use the hands instead, which would have been the more efficient action. Um, so also in this case, uh, infants, they selectively copied the action that they thought to be relevant. 
And it's not only that uh, um, infants, they attribute relevance uh, to the information that they receive in, uh, uh, in the context of ostension, but that actually this attributed relevance could, uh, can even override the perceived efficiency of the novel action. Um, so we showed this in a study uh, where we demonstrated to 18 months old infants how to operate on a novel device. So on this device, there were two buttons, and when we press these buttons, uh, this uh, heart-shaped lamp in the middle lit up, and there was also a bim bam sound. But while we were demonstrating this, we had two demonstrators who were more or less efficient. Um, so one demonstrator was only pressing one button three times, and out of the three times, the button worked for her twice. Whereas for the other demonstrator who pressed the other button again three times, the button worked only once. But efficiency wasn't the only thing that we manipulated, but uh, we also varied with uh, these demonstrators. They were communicating with the infants why they demonstrated how to operate on the device in a way that we pitted efficiency against ostension. So the demonstrator who was more efficient didn't communicate with the infants at all, whereas the demonstrator who was less efficient uh, um, was communicating, so she explicitly uh, told the infants that now she's going to show them something, and then uh, she performed the demonstration. And so after that, uh, uh, what we were interested, that when infants, they had the possibility to try the device by themselves, which button they would choose to press, and what we found that the majority of the infants, they prefer to press uh, the ostensibly uh, presented button, even though that was less sufficient. So indeed, it seems that ostensive cues, they did not only induce an expectation of relevance, but that this attributed relevance could even override the perceived efficiency of the novel actions. Now, what about apes? Um, so in the case of apes, there is some evidence uh, that they are also sensitive to ostensive cues. So for example, similar to humans, they also prefer direct eye gaze uh, as opposed to averted eye gaze. And they are also sensitive to communicative cues such as eye contact or calling their name. And it's not only that they are sensitive to these cues, but uh, under, uh, under certain circumstances, uh, they would also produce these cues. Um, so there is some kind of similar sensitivity to ostension also in their case, but what we don't know whether they would also attribute more relevance to the ostensibly transmitted information. Um, so to answer this, we designed an observational learning paradigm with the apes where we showed them how to operate on a food dispenser device. And this was the apparatus that we used. Um, so here, uh, as you can see, on the, on the top of the device, there was a hole where objects could be inserted. And after the insertion of these objects, they fell into a kind of small chamber in the middle. And if the device got successfully activated, then there was a beep sound and uh, also a light turned up. And then at the bottom of the device, uh, a small food pellet got released in a way that the ape could get access to this food and, um, and uh, have it as a reward. Um, but then, again, similar to the infant studies, uh, similar to the infant study that I just showed, also here we had two demonstrators uh, who differed in their efficiency, why they were showing to the apes how to operate on this device, in a way that they were using different objects when they uh, demonstrated how the device works. And these objects, they represented different levels of efficiency um, because for each demonstrator, uh, one object uh, worked twice while she was uh, um, showing how the device works. Whereas for the other demonstrator, the other object that the other demonstrator used uh, never worked out of, the three, uh, out of the two attempts. So both demonstrators, uh, they showed twice how to operate on the device. Uh, but for one demonstrator, the object worked twice out of the two attempts, whereas for the other demonstrator, the object never worked. And this was the design. Um, we had three conditions. Uh, so first, we had an only ostensive condition where both demonstrators, they were communicating with the apes, why they showed them how to operate on the device. 
But just like I said, they differed in their efficiency. So one demonstrator was efficient twice, the other demonstrator was never efficient. Then we also had an only non-ostensive condition where neither of the demonstrators, they were communicating. Um, so we had these two conditions because uh, on the one hand we wanted to know uh, whether apes, they are able to uh, detect uh, efficiency. And on the other hand, we wanted to see that how much uh, communication would help or hinder them um, in uh, the detection of efficiency. And finally, we also had the critical condition uh, where we pitted ostension against efficiency in a way, uh, just like in the infant study, that why one demonstrator was efficient, she wasn't communicating, and the other demonstrator who was never efficient, she was communicating with the apes. Okay, and uh, what do I mean by communication? Uh, so in the case of the ostensive condition, the demonstrator first made an eye contact with the apes, and then she was holding the object in the visibility of the ape, and while she was holding the object, she also said hello to the apes. Uh, in the non-ostensive condition, however, uh, the demonstrator never made an eye contact with an ape. She was still holding the object in the visibility of the ape, uh, but while she was holding the object, she was just looking at the object, and she said, aha. Uh -huh. And then both of them, they approached the device and uh, the ostensive demonstrator, she was clapping with the hand, which we know that uh, is a strong communicative signal to the apes. Whereas the non-communicative demonstrator, uh, she was just knocking the floor with the object in the hand. And after that, depending on whether it was an efficient or a non-efficient uh, demonstration, uh, they inserted the object, and in the case of the efficient trials, uh, the device got activated, so there was this beep sound, the light turned up, and then the food pellet got released, so the ape got rewarded. Whereas in the case of the non-efficient trials, nothing happened upon inserting the object. And then there was the test when uh, we put both objects on a tray, and we push the tray towards the ape in a way that uh, at this point, uh, neither of the demonstrators were making an eye contact, so they were just looking down. And then the ape could choose between the, obje uh, between the two objects, and after choosing, we gave them the chosen object. And depending on whether they chose the efficient or the inefficient object, uh, when they inserted it, the device got either activated or not. So they, they got only rewarded if uh, they managed to choose the efficient object. Um, so I only show the critical ostensive versus efficient condition now, so an example from that condition. And for some reasons I don't have sound. I don't know if, um, hmm? I, I, I can't even control the sound on the computer. So ah, because you're I connected by HDMI, yeah, yeah, yeah. so you'd have to change in the presentation. Is it from way outside or? Well, okay, then I will produce the sound. My cursor disappeared. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Let's look at the screen because we can see it. If you oh, can see it, you have to drag it, it back. Okay. So, okay, good. sorry. Okay, uh, so I guess that this started, yes, with the non ostensive uh, demonstration. So here uh, the demonstrator just said, uh huh, by showing the object, and uh, he went to the device, and now there is the knocking on the floor. Again, showing the object, and now he's inserting into the device. And you see that the ape just got the food, so she immediately grabbed it and ate it. And now there is the second demonstration, again, knocking on the floor. Again, now he says, uh huh, he inserts the object, and again, the device works, so the ape got the reward again. Uh, 
And now comes the communicative demonstrator. So as you see now, he's making an eye contact and he said hello. Now there is the clapping. Now he inserts the object and nothing happens. And actually the ape is a bit disappointed. So now comes the second demonstration, again clapping. Inserting the object. And again, nothing happened. And now the critical part, when the ape can choose. <coughs> and now there is a bit of hesitation. And in the end, she chose the ostensibly demonstrated object. So now the device is not going to work for her. And yes, there is a bit of disappointment. <laughs> Okay, so let's see the results. Um, so now these are the proportions of uh, efficient object choices in the three conditions. Um, so when both demonstrators, they were communicating and they only differed in their efficiency, the majority of the apes, so approximately 70%, they managed to choose the efficient object. And in the only non-ostensive condition, uh, the performance dropped a bit, but still it was absolutely above chance level. So in both of these conditions, apes could successfully detect the efficiency. On the other hand, when we pitted against efficiency with ostension, this performance dropped to chance level. So here apes, they chose equally often both the efficient and the inefficient object. And actually their performance in this condition was significantly worse, both compared to the only ostensive and to the only non-ostensive condition. So indeed it seems that uh, communication biased them towards choosing uh, the ostensively presented object, even though they could see with their own eyes that this object never worked and they, got never, uh, they were never rewarded. Okay, but what if all this is about attention? So, what if apes uh, didn't manage to choose the efficient object because uh, for some reasons communication made them um, uh, just uh, less attentive uh, about the demonstration? So to check on this, uh, we decided also to measure looking time in a way uh, that uh, we divided the trials into two parts. So first we measured their looking time into the first part, which was the part uh, where uh, depending on the condition, either there were the, uh, ostens there were the ostensive signals or the non-ostensive attention gather signals. And then we also measured separately the looking time in the second part, which was the actual part of the demonstration, which didn't differ across conditions. So that, that part was identical in all conditions. And what we found that indeed in this first part, so the part of the ostensive signaling versus non-ostensive signaling, apes, they tended to pay, to look more, so possibly to pay more attention when the demonstrators were communicating to them. But when we measured the looking time only during the actual uh, demonstration of the device, we didn't find any difference. So in some, uh, these differences in their object choices uh, cannot be explained by different amount of attention that uh, they would have paid during the uh, action demonstration. So to conclude, uh, what we see is that uh, many apes, they had the opportunity to choose between an efficient and an inefficient method. They managed to reliably choose the efficient method, both in the only ostensive and in the only non-ostensive conditions. But when the inefficient method was demonstrated in a communicative way, then they started to ignore efficiency and they chose equally often both the efficient and the inefficient method. So it seems that uh, just like human infants, apes uh, tend to interpret the communicated, uh, the communicated information as uh, relevant to them, which it's an open question that uh, it might lead to similar learning biases. So it might be that uh, 
Also, in their case, there would be a preference to learn from communication as opposed to other information sources. So, thank you for the attention. Uh, okay, I see three hands here and four hands. Okay, so let's uh, start with Mike. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one is uh, efficiency and ostension are confounded. Now, you're assuming that the efficiency is a preferred one, but what if they're curious to explore uh, the one that didn't work to see if it might work? So y you're, you're pitting efficiency against, uh, you're acting like they're pitted against one another, but uh, the ostension always goes with the inefficient. You need a two by two design with efficiency and ostension fully separate, no? Am I misunderstanding something? The, the uh, you mean ostension always goes with efficiency in that third condition. Well, in the third condition, yes, but uh, then we have also the, the first and the second conditions where um, one demonstrator is always efficient and the other is never efficient. So if, uh, if it was about curiosity, then I assume that also in those conditions, uh, many times they should just choose the inefficient method and uh, explore what is happening. Yeah, but, uh, okay, but you don't have the two-by-two two design where you have each one of them. Uh, which, which would be... Uh, which would be efficient, inefficient, ostensive, and non-ostensive in a two-by-two two design where you You mean that the efficient would be the non-ostensive? Uh, uh, the inefficient would be the non-ostensive and the efficient no, would no, be the, the ostensive. Inefficient would sometimes be ostensive and sometimes uh, uh, non-ostensive and the efficient would sometimes be ostensive and sometimes be non-ostensive. Yeah, 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 I see, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay, anyway, uh, second question is, uh, these are clearly the same chimps, uh, and it's clearly the same uh, individuals. Uh, were the, was the order of uh, conditions counterbalanced? No, 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 no. So uh, it, it, this was the order how I presented that first we started with the only ostensive, then with the non-ostensive, okay. and then the ostensive and the efficient. Okay, thank you. All right, I was asked to encourage younger members of the community also to ask questions, so that's your chance, raise your hands before I... <laughs> okay, no one for the moment. So let's go, Gil, Luca, Eugenio, and then maybe we have enough, <laughs> enough time for Keith, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> Try to ask short questions. Hannes Rakos, you just said it, I'm young, so that's okay. <laughs> um, thank you, Hannah. Uh, I guess it's a similar question to some extent to, um, uh, to Mike's. Uh, and that is, uh, is it, po and I don't know if it matters for you so much, but is it the case that the chimps who saw the ostensive inefficient demonstrator, are they, are they questioning the efficiency of the person or the efficiency of the tool? Uh, so they could say that, well, that person is clumsy. Uh, that demonstrator doesn't know how to operate this thing, but clearly this is the object that should be used. So that's why, in a sense, they're choosing the object that was ostensibly demonstrated because they believe that object should work the fact that that person didn't succeed, it's his clumsiness. Yeah, that's absolutely a possibility, but uh, this wouldn't go against uh, the argument that uh, there is an attribution of relevance here. So uh, it might be that uh, the way they see this demonstration that yes, what she's showing to me that uh, this is the object that I'm supposed to use, and uh, for some reasons she doesn't manage because uh, I don't know, she's uh, not that skillful, but for me it's going to work, yes. That's an open question whether in these situations uh, they would actually detect less efficiency due to the uh, communication, or they would be able to detect absolutely, but they would have this kind of um, yeah, interpretation. No, I let, just to follow up, I mean, to say why I'm asking the question, because if it is an attribution about the demonstrator, then it speaks to theories of this kind of phenomenon about affiliation uh, and that kind of thing. Whereas if it is uh, an argument, or if, if it is an attribution about the object, then uh, that's why they're using that object. Then it doesn't have to be about the affiliation with a particular demonstrator, sure. but it has to do with yeah, about yeah, yeah. Like, you know, yeah. cultural learning of some kind. Yeah, I mean, actually a control condition that uh, we wanted to do, just we didn't have the, the opportunity for that, would have been to offer these objects in the end of the demonstration by a new person, just to exclude that there would be yeah, anything related to the demonstrators. Okay, we have about two more minutes, so Luca and then Eugenio. 
Thank you, Anna. Just a question. Uh, so in the, in the conflict condition, uh, performance dog to chance. Mm -hmm. So how do we interpret this uh, in terms of, so what, what does ostension do? Does it, is it something, so IEPs are confused essentially, you can say that. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that it depends on some conflict of information? Not, and we have, with Christina Galuska, we have done something which reminds me of this kind of experience with humans, adults, and we, we give uh, either ostensive or non-ostensive presentation of an action uh, ac um, attached to an object. And uh, what we find is that when there is already prior information about an object, so the object is known and you know that you use it in a certain particular way, uh, the ostensive cue is actually detrimental. Mm -hmm. So it just gets uh, uh, learners not to learn anything in this kind of condition. I wonder if you think that the same thing could happen here, that uh, uh, apes are just confused because general ostension comes with uh, good communication, and so they really you know, throw off their hands, they don't know what to do. Well, yeah, I think that the fact that, uh, that the performance is at chance level shows this, that uh, I mean, that there, there are still uh, individuals who would choose the efficient object, but um, there, there must be some kind of confusion. So that, that's why, uh, uh, like, but then how, how you know, do half you of them. Yeah, but then the control condition should be a condition in which there is no tension, but there is a conflict of information, or else you would, uh, you know, complement what you say by saying, no, this is not just about any conflict of information. It's really about those tension. That's my, I mean, worry or whatever. I mean, the point is that generally in these kind of situations, there is always but that when you try to explain something to the ape or to the kids for that matter, you actually do it in an efficient way, not in a non-efficient way. So the question is what counts here in your opinion? Is it really ostension or the fact that there is a conflict that they don't, don't know how to solve the conflict? Yeah, I, I, I see what you mean, but I think that, you know, this conflict is already a result of uh, how they interpret communication, which, uh, is my main argument that, uh, that it's not only a human specific thing that when you provide these ostensive cues, the, the interpretation would be that now this person is telling me something that I should pay attention to, it's important for me, uh, probably it's a, you know, verse to learn. Uh, but um, I mean, uh, if, if, uh, if they react in a similar manner, then uh, this is the thing that could lead to a potential confusion but we can talk more about this. Okay, so last question from Keith. And okay. I, okay, thanks, Hannah. I'm okay, so uh, my question is that it seemed that if I understood correctly, there were two cues in the ostensive um, condition where the experimenter made eye contact with the chimpanzee and then additionally clapped. Did you try to tease those apart? Because clapping is something they have a long, long history with and it might actually be more imperative than anything that might be called ostensive, whereas the eye contact might be more communicative in that regard. I see, okay, thanks. All, all right. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Hannah. <laughs> Okay, perfect. So uh, our last speaker is Elizabeth Renner from University of Stirling. Okay, today I'm going to talk about capuchin monkeys and children's use of information from various sources, virtual, individual, and social, in a touchscreen-based stimulus choice task. So field primatologists have reported very convincing evidence across a number of primate species of cultures that is variations in social and foraging behaviors across different populations of a species that are not necessarily attributable to ecological differences. So I think we can say that there is culture that has been reported for humans, obviously, but also chimpanzees, orangutans, possibly macaque monkeys, and also capuchin monkeys. While culture is not widespread in the primate world that we know of yet, it is not also rare. But one kind of culture among primates is rare uh, and has been found only in humans so far, and that is cumulative culture. And cumulative culture 
is the social transmission of these behaviors and artifacts uh, over time that accumulate innovations, becoming more efficient or more functional, and eventually reaching a level of complexity that is greater than any one individual could develop on their own. And I think it's inarguable that cumulative culture has been beneficial for human survival. Uh, and the question is, why would humans develop cumulative culture and not other species of primates? So one proposal that's been uh, put forward so far is that perhaps humans do these really cognitively complex activities like imitating others, teaching, or using their theory of mind. And that non-human primate species either do not do these things at all or do them to a much lesser extent. One can think of other possibilities for the big species difference in cumulative culture. Um, one among these possibilities is that perhaps at a much lower level, human and non-human primates use social information differently, use the information that they acquire others, that they acquire from others differently. So that might involve either paying more attention to this socially acquired information. It might involve a difference in the likelihood of copying others' behavior as opposed to copying, for example, one's own behavior. Or it might involve an increased fidelity of copying when you do choose to do so. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about this second possibility, the likelihood of copying others' behavior compared to one's own. To do this, we developed a touchscreen-based task. One type of trial you might see as a participant is a two-stimulus array. In an information trial, you might be given some information about the reward value of one of the stimuli, so in this case, the white diamond. Uh, you get some feedback about the reward value of that stimulus, so the sunburst means that was the rewarded stimulus, that's the right answer. And then as a participant, you would see an identical test trial and have the opportunity to then find the reward yourself. The contingency remains the same, so the white diamond is still going to be rewarded in the test trial. Another type of trial you might see is a three stimulus array. Again, you might get some information in the information trial about the reward value of, say, the yellow circle. The feedback screen is telling you, oh, that one was not the rewarded stimulus. And the test trial then would be identical to the information trial, and your opportunity now is to explore this array. So in this task, the optimal strategy is to repeat the selection from the information trial if it is a win, as shown in the top row, right? Just do the same thing, because it was right. Uh, and then to shift away from an incorrect response after a lose in the information trial, such as shown in the bottom row there. And if you're right, and on the test trial, you find the sunburst, you get the rewarded stimulus. If you're a monkey, you would get a raisin. If you're a child, you might get a small sticker uh, on your sticker sheet. So we used three different conditions that enabled us to compare how the primates and children were using information. Uh, in the information trial, the information could come from a virtual or animated queue in which the computer was demonstrating what was happening. So you would see a little cartoon blue hand move up on the screen, make contact with one of the stimuli, and then the feedback screen would show you what happened. In the individual condition, the participant would explore on the information trial and select one of the items in the array and then also do the test trial. And then finally, in the social condition, the experimenter, who is a human adult, would demonstrate by selecting one of the items in the array. Um, so this, these three different types, sources of information allowed us to give exactly equivalent information in individual and social conditions, as well as this virtual condition in which the participant was not actually generating the information, but they were still exposed to it. So our participants were 15 capuchin monkeys at the Living Link Center at Edinburgh Zoo. Uh, they did a number of different sessions, up to 42. Uh, each session had a different information source, so in one session you might only get information from the social source or only from the individual source. We also tested 28 children, uh, mostly three-year-olds, and these children each got one session with one, so sorry, three sessions each with one different source. And all of the other variables, such as the size of the array and the quality of the information, so win or lose, uh, was intermixed in each of the sessions. 
So we could use a couple of different measures to look at the performance of these individuals. The simplest one is, well, I wouldn't say simplest. One of the ones uh, is a win, stay, lose, shift measure. So that's a binary variable. If after a win trial you stayed and selected the same stimulus, you get a one score. Uh, if after a lose you shifted and chose a different stimulus, also a one. And then if you win shifted or lose stayed, you'd get a zero. So that's basically a measure of are you using the optimal strategy for this task. The other measure we used is just a repeats measure. So did you in the test trial select the same thing that was selected in the information trial? And that's the measure that I'm mostly going to be talking about right now. So predictions would be that if indeed children are more likely to copy others' behavior compared to their own behavior, that the results would look a little bit like this. So more repeats, more repetitions of the information trial selection in the social condition compared to both the virtual and the individual condition. And we wouldn't necessarily, uh, based on our hypotheses, make any specific predictions for what the monkeys did. But we also need to consider one of the other variables, which is the quality of the information, right? Whether you've seen the right answer or the wrong answer. So are children going to have differential sensitivity based on those two, uh, based on those two value values? Uh, so it could be that children are both uh, more likely to repeat only win trials uh, in the social condition and then sort of middlingly likely to repeat the wrong responses, or they may be more likely to repeat both kind of responses from a social demonstrator. Uh, and again, we wouldn't necessarily hypothesize anything about the monkeys, just based on the, our hypotheses so far. Um, so first I'll talk about very briefly the non-expert capuchin monkeys that ended up being 13 uh, of them. Uh, we call them non-experts simply because they didn't reach a certain performance threshold in the test trials of 80%. Um, right, so we've got the, along the x-axis, the different conditions. The pink bars are the test trials after win information trials, and the blue bars are performance in the test trials after lose information trials. On the left are the two stimulus arrays, on the right are the three stimulus arrays, and on the y-axis is repeats. So your best strategy is to repeat more after a win information trial and repeat less after a lose information trial. And so if you're doing a good job on this task, you have very high pink bars and very low blue bars. So the non-expert capuchin monkeys did show an effective source, that is they were more likely to repeat their own responses from the information trial in the test trial, uh, regardless of, well, bo both if those responses had resulted in a win and if they had resulted in a lose. And they were more likely to do this in the individual condition than the social and virtual conditions. Uh, and they showed much more sensitivity to the reward value, win or lose, of the information trial in the individual condition than in the social condition. So that's fine, these monkeys didn't really understand the general contingencies of the task. Uh, but let's talk about the expert capuchin. So the uh, graphs are set up the exact same way, two stimulus on the left, three on the right, uh, pink bars are win, blue bars are lose. So the expert capuchins, you'll notice right away, did something very different than the non-expert capuchins. Uh, they were really good at repeating after a win. Um, and there was actually no difference in how they treated the information from the three various sources. So now I'll talk about the children. Uh, I'll talk about first what they had in common with the expert capuchin monkeys, which was that they were also much better at repeating after a win. Uh, and they were repeating much, well sorry, repeating much more after a win than they were after a lose. In addition, there was no difference in uh, repeating behavior based on source, so they didn't copy their own or uh, others' behavior any more than any other type of behavior. Uh, one thing you might notice about this chart is there was much less copying of the rewarded item than the capuchin monkeys, which was pretty striking to us. Um, so overall, in summary, the non-expert capuchins seem to have a repeat bias for their own actions in the individual condition. The expert monkeys were very consistently repeating after wins, and children were consistently shifting after loses, uh, and they appeared to approach the task with a weak don't repeat bias. But looking to our bigger question of whether humans and non-human primates use social information differently in this task, expert monkeys had no difference in performance based on the source of the information, Neither did children. And so in general, to ask the, uh, answer the question of whether humans are more likely to copy others' behavior compared to one's own, in this task, the answer is no. 
But before we can discard this idea completely, I think it might be useful to do some uh, future tasks, uh, which are slightly more complex. So examine the role of complexity. Uh, if we, for example, gave children a little bit more of a challenge for their working memory or gave a larger stimulus array to increase uncertainty, would that encourage them to take greater advantage of social information they were given? And for my own personal interest, I'd be interested in seeing uh, what other species would do on this task. Are capuchin monkeys, for example, a very good representative of primates? Are they doing something different than other primates? So I'd like to thank uh, all of my collaborators for working with me, all the institutions who let me collect data, and all of you for listening. Questions? All right. Yeah, OK. <laughs> All right, can you say a little bit more about your motivation to include the animated queue as a condition? What, what were your, um, can you explain your hypotheses and the theory behind that? Right, yes. Yeah. So um, the animated queue is a bit like a control for the social condition in that it's, it generates information outside of the participant. Uh, but like takes an, the, the role of the agent away. And so it's been proposed that sometimes agents, uh, when they're demonstrating things, can actually be a bit distracting. Uh, in some cases for monkeys, for example, uh, previous studies have shown that if you've got sort of an sense of human doing something, it's kind of a distractor for the monkeys. And so if you take away the distraction of like having an agent moving about in the monkey's field of vision and you're just giving them the same information, are they able to actually utilize it? Uh, and the good news is the expert capuchins were able to utilize it, and so were the kids. So uh, I guess the other good news is the actual human didn't appear to be a distractor in this particular case for these guys. So it wasn't like a social demonstrator wasn't depressing their performance either. Uh, I see one question over there. And then. Hi, thank you very much. This is uh, about what's the species difference and what isn't. Right, so if you have two out of 15 capuchin monkeys that behave, that show behavior pattern that um, matches that of the kids, are we looking at the absence of the presence of a species difference? And I just wonder what your perspective was. So are we looking, uh, let, me, let me think about this here. <laughs> I think the relevant comparison is sort of the expert capuchins compared to the children just because they did appear to master the contingencies of the task. But I wouldn't say that the actual pattern of results was all that similar between them. Um, you'll notice that the capuchins, like I said, were really good at repeating after a win where the kids were much more explorative and were more likely to shift after a win than the capuchins. So I think there is still a species difference. I'm not saying that their performance is equivalent at all. But I think the relevant one, the comparison to look at here is the experts. All right. Joe, do, do you still have a question? Please make it very, very short. Just a clarification question. The, your social model was just kind of performing the action or was also in a, a communicative or ostensive uh, you know, situation it was with the ape? Non ostensive. And uh, the experiment was also rewarding the monkey as well. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.